Psalm 23. Il Divino Pastore, Salmo di Davide. O Signore è il mio pastore e nada mi faltará. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. El Señor es mi pastor. The Herr is mein Hirte. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Nada mi faltará. I have all that I need. Il Signore è mio pastore e nulla mi manca. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. I have all that I need. He leads me beside peaceful streams. I have all that I need. He leads me beside peaceful streams. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. 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 He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. I have all that I need. He renews my strength. He renews my strength. Er gibt mir Kraft. He renews my strength. He refreshes my soul. And give me Kraft for me. He guides me. He guides me along right paths. He guides me along right paths. He guides me along right paths. Bringing honor to his name. Bringing honor to his name. Bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Ainda que eu andasse pelo vale da sombra da morte. Even when I walk through the darkest valley. Even when I walk through the darkest valley. Porque tú estás a mi lado. I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. Even when I walk through the darkest valley. I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. For you are close beside me. For you are close beside me. For you are with me. I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. For you are close beside me. For you are close beside me. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Tu vara y tu casado me protegen y confortan. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. Your rod and your staff protect me and comfort me. I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Preparas uma mesa perante mim na presença dos meus inimigos. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows. My cup overflows with blessings. My cup overflows with blessings. My cup overflows with blessings. I have all that I need. My cup overflows with blessings. My cup overflows with blessings. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. My cup overflows with blessing. All the days of my life. My cup overflows with blessing. All the days of my life. Todos los días de mi vida. All the days of my life. Si cuzotes a mi shango. All the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. 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 Para siempre. Forever. 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 E io abiterò nella casa del Signore per lunghi giorni. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. E abitarei na casa do Senhor por longos dias. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. 
Wow, what an amazing video. Worship leaders across the globe sharing the healing words of Psalm 23 in such a dynamic and powerful way. Welcome to Community Online. My name is Tammy Melchin and I lead the teaching team here at Community. I am so glad that you are joining us today as we come together to celebrate God. What a week it has been, certainly an unprecedented season for all of us. Uh, last week, we were joined online by attenders from 13 different states and four countries, which is amazing. But we also realize that most of our online attenders are participating right here in Illinois. And in case you missed it, the governor of Illinois issued a stay at home order that went into effect Saturday at 5 p.m. Before we set up here at our Naperville location to broadcast today's service, we confirmed that we were in compliance with the stay at home order. We are grateful that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services considers the work of faith-based leaders an essential service to the community. Now, of course, the guidelines from the CDC could change and our teams are continuing to remain flexible and attentive to every piece of information we receive from the government. I'm not gonna lie, it hasn't been easy, but just like you, we are moving forward one day at a time. I know I never anticipated a time when the most loving thing I could do for people was to stay away from them, but that is where we are right now. My guess is many of us are struggling with this season of social distancing, perhaps feeling a heightened sense of fear or loneliness or anxiety during these uncertain times. As we begin today, I'd like to remind you that you are not alone. Listen to these words from the prophet Isaiah as if God is speaking directly to you at this moment. The Lord says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You are not alone. God is with you. God is with us. And we will help one another get through this together. Let me tell you about a few ways we can help each other. First, at the bottom of the screen, you'll find the prayer button. If you need prayer for anything going on in your life or the lives of those you love, feel free to push that button at any time. The members of our prayer team would love to pray for you. Second, in addition to the support people are receiving in their small groups, we wanted to figure out ways to serve the needs of our community at large. So we are forming a new ministry called Community Cares. We've identified 10 current needs that we can mobilize around. Needs such as homelessness and food insecurity and, and high-risk individuals. If you'd like to learn about how you can join a Community Cares team to help with these critical needs, I encourage you to click on the banner below to visit communitychristian.org online where you will find more information. If you are new to Community, welcome. We are so glad that you found us online. Do me a favor and, and actually head to our digital connect card. You can find it on our app, or by visiting communitychristian.org slash communication, or by clicking the link below. We would love to hear from you. Lastly, I wanna encourage you to share this experience with others right now. In the lower left-hand side, there are buttons for you to do that on Twitter or Facebook or to send an email invite. Go ahead and do that right now. It's a great way that you can help people find their way back to God. As we get ready to worship God through singing, let me just say, one of the things I'm really missing right now is watching our students sing. God is doing such a great work in the lives of our students. In fact, I snuck into their Stuco online Instagram gathering this past Wednesday to experience a bit of it. If you are a student or if you have students, make sure you check that out this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m. Follow stuco.online on Instagram to be a part of it. But for right now, we're gonna worship with our students as we sing a couple songs together. These songs were recorded this past January at the Blast Winter Conference. So turn up the volume on your TV or device, feel free to stand up in your living room if you like, and let's celebrate God together. All right, let's sing it out together, come on. Eyes wide, I'm set on you. You made a road in the wild, standing on ancient truth. I'm pressing on with my back to the past and go. Let the young see visions of the future, and I see oh.
Every once in a while, we feel like God leads us to call an audible on the Big Idea series. And this week, we've sensed him leading us in that direction. We're still going to do the Big Word series we told you about last week, but we're going to delay it a few weeks. Instead, this week, we're starting a brand new three-week series called How to Get Through What You're Going Through. It's certainly a relevant topic to what we're experiencing. And so today, our lead pastor, Dave Ferguson, is going to bring us the first message in this series. Before we go to Dave, I want to let you know that later on we'll be taking communion together. I encourage you to grab a piece of bread or cracker and a glass of juice or water right now so that you can be part of that important moment later. Any items that you can eat or drink will work. All right, there is nothing that God can't do. And that certainly includes getting us through what we're going through. Hello, community family, and uh, we're not really just one church meeting at 11 locations. Actually, today, we are one church meeting at probably several thousands of locations. And so wherever you are, uh, across Chicagoland or even around the world, uh, I want to welcome you, and it is good, good, good to be together uh, today. Um, I also want to encourage you, if you haven't already, you know, share what we're about to talk about. Share it. Uh, you can click on the Twitter link or on the Facebook link or an email. Send it out to other people so they can be a part of this. But I just want to say welcome, and it's good to be together. Now, like you, um, I've been stuck at home all week. Um, and then... And then came the announcement from our governor, the, the stay-at-home order. Uh, now, fortunately, we were deemed uh, an essential service. So basically, I get to go for a run, and then once a week, I get to come and talk to you guys. So this is kind of it. And, and I was thinking about all that, and I think a lot of us are probably starting to feel maybe already a little bit of cabin fever, because we're going, you know, we've already been together for a week or so, not really going anywhere. And then on top of that, it um, doesn't look like there's going to be a spring vacation Maybe uh, no spring breaks, no trips anywhere. So I had an idea. What if we all took a trip together, like a vacation together? I'll tell you what, right now in the chat room, I would love to hear from you. Where would you like to go right now if you could on a vacation? If you could take a trip somewhere, where would you want to go? Just go ahead and type that in there right now. Because I was thinking about this. If we were to take a trip together, um, I definitely want to be outside, right? We're done with being inside. Uh, Something that we really kind of escape, maybe explore God's beauty. What if, what if we all took a trip to the Grand Tetons? That'd be pretty cool, huh? I'll tell you what, here we go. All right, now that was a short vacation, (laughs) but it was a vacation, right? Wouldn't that be pretty awesome? That was the Bridger Teton National Forest in Wyoming. Um, I've been able to travel a lot of places across the United States and and even around the world, but I've actually never been there. And this amazing national forest has 600 miles of hiking trails. Doesn't that sound good about right now? Um, It has some of the most spectacular mountains anywhere in our country and really anywhere in the world. So I was kind of doing a little homework on the Bridger Wilderness area, and I came across some stuff, both that was interesting and beautiful, but but also some stuff that kind of cracked me up. And uh, apparently there is a comment box that they leave at the base of the mountain where hikers, after they've gone on a hike, can leave suggestions how to improve things. So I want to share with you some actual sample suggestions, actual comments that they left on how to make things better on, in the Tetons. Here we go. Um, here's one of them. It was this. How about if we please avoid building trails that go uphill? <laughs> I mean, when you decide to go for a hike, what about Teton did you not understand? Um, here's a second comment they gave us. Or they gave them. Ski lifts need to be in some places so that we can get to wonderful views without having to hike to them. This last one's my favorite one, all right? 
Escalators would help on steep uphill sections. <laughs> I love that one. All right, I mean, kind of like, what about climbing a mountain do we not get? It's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be challenging. It's part of the journey. Now, I think the truth is this, and I think these comments only reinforce it. We don't really like hard things. And if these last two weeks have taught me anything, I mean, I am not a big fan of difficult things. I'm not a big fan of being uncomfortable. And I think specifically, most all of us, we do not like struggle. We don't like pain. We don't like tough times. And in fact, I'll tell you what, right now in the chat room, okay, I'm just gonna ask you a question. Do you like struggle, do you like pain? You can just put yes or no in there, put it in there. Yes or no, do you like struggle, do you like pain? I hope not. I think most of us, we prefer a path, right? That's just kind of level, that's smooth. And if, and, and if we have to go uphill, yeah, get me an escalator. I think we do, we try to avoid all pain that we can. And guess what? That's smart. It's smart to try to avoid pain. But here's the problem. Pain, struggle, <laughs> tough times are inevitable. In fact, Jesus told us this in John chapter 16, verse 33. He said this, in this world, <laughs> you will have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. Every person will experience some of it. Struggle is just a part of life. And in fact, right now, probably the one thing that all of you listen to me and all of us really around the world right now have in common is that together, we're going through a tough time. And it was for that reason that we decided as we were getting ready for this, uh, this online experience, this celebration service, we're going like, you know what? I think we need to change our big idea. Because we were planning on doing a series called Big Words, but we're gonna, and it's a great series, we're gonna put that off for a few weeks. And we wanted to deal with this topic for the next three weeks, how to get through what you're going through. How to get through what you're going through. Now for some of us, tough times, I mean, this, what you're experiencing right now, it's, it's some brand new stuff. For others of you, I mean, nah, tough times, it's all too familiar. Bring it on. And I know for some of you, for some of you, the tough times that you're experiencing have nothing to do with COVID-19. And the brutal reality is that we all struggle through tough times. Sometimes it's something you got yourself into. It was a poor decision you made and it took you down this path and it took you to a place you never intended to be. It could be a situation that was brought on by someone else and perhaps your pain is a result of somebody else's bad decision. Or it might be like right now, it could be that just life hit you with circumstances that were way beyond your control. You have really nobody to blame for it, but here it is nonetheless. Struggle is a reality of life. Every one of us are gonna go through stuff. Now here's why this series is so important though, and I want you to get this right now. It's how, how we get through what we're going through that really matters. It's how, how you and I, how we respond to difficult circumstances that can actually set the trajectory for the rest of our life and actually our journey with God. And so what's happening in these days and weeks right now is so, so, so important. In fact, a number of scholars and theologians have characterized our spiritual journey in kind of a stages or, or phases. And, and you, it, it's more complicated than this, but they've kind of summarized it so we can understand it in what they call three different stages or phases. The, the, the first stage or phase is, is simply this, what we call a confident faith. A confident faith. Now, now, a confident faith is typically like right when we find our way back to God. Uh, it's a stage that can last sometimes for a very long time, and, and it's a time when we're excited. It's a time when life finally feels like it's all that we hope for it to be. Uh, we pray, and we get answered prayer. Uh, we obey God, and it feels like God blesses us for it. We experience joy. We experience gratitude. I mean, those are the things that we call a confident faith. Now, no matter how long this confident faith lasts, inevitably, okay, at some point, we're gonna find ourselves in the next phase, the next stage, the next season, and that's what we call a challenged faith. A challenged faith. Because all of a sudden, what happens is life doesn't work quite like you thought it was going to. Fears begin to emerge. Doubts begin to grow. Even it's kind of, I would call it, even spiritual fatigue begins to happen. And it feels like sometimes when we pray, like our prayers are just kind of hitting the ceiling and coming bouncing back. Obedience doesn't seem to be getting us anywhere. And you know what? We long for the days of these days here where things were new and vibrant and we were so, so, so confident and really unstoppable. 
That's what happens during the challenge faith. And I'll tell you what, I feel like, and I don't know if you're like this, but I feel like last week just kind of like catapulted me right into that, right into this right here, challenge faith. I mean, last week when all of a sudden, and this is just for me, when we got the news that, oh, you know what, no groups of 250 or more can meet. I start scrambling with our team, trying to figure out, okay, how do we bring everything, all of our celebration services, 10 locations, 25 services, how do we bring them all online? And part of me is also going like, why, God, why? And then came the news, oh, you, we can't meet in groups of more than 50. And then we can't meet in groups of more than 10. And when that happens, you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of small groups and people are counting on each other, support each other, encourage them. We had to take all of those online. And part of me is going like, why, God? One morning last week, it was early, Sue and I both woke up and she grabbed my arm and she just said to me, she said, I'm scared. I'm scared. And for those of you who do know my wife, Sue, I mean, she's, she's not scared of much. And I'm not, sure I'd, I'm not sure I've heard that in 30 some years of marriage. And then you see the rising number of people that have the virus and the, and the number of people that, uh, that, that now it's taking their life and that you start calling your kids and you're checking on how they're doing. This is just for me. And you're going like, why God? How about you? How are you dealing with all this stuff? And specifically, how are you getting through what we're going through? Here's what I want you to do, and I think this will, be, this will be helpful to you, so stick with me on this. I would love for you to take just a second right now and just either write down on a piece of paper or you can use our notes section on the lower right-hand side of our website. There's a little section that says notes, and it asks a question in there, what makes life tough right now? What makes life tough right now? And go ahead, just type in a sentence, type in a few words, or maybe just one word. That what, what is it that makes life tough for you, uniquely you right now? What's causing the pain? Now, we're going to come back to that a little bit. But this challenged faith, okay, here's what you got to get about this challenged faith. This challenged faith has the potential, okay, and this is why I want to give you some encouragement, the potential, okay, to take us to a third stage, and a third stage that people that have really understand how spiritual journeys work understand as a living faith. And a living faith is this place, and you can get there, where you have this deep, abiding faith, the kind of faith that remains strong, even in the middle of life's most difficult situations. And I think most of us, we want that kind of faith. We, we want to have peace no matter what. We want to have hope when other people don't. We want to be confident no matter what life throws our way that God is good and, and he's got our back and we're in this together. But here's the thing, and this is more real for me probably right now than it's been in a long, long time. The only way for you to grow to having a living faith is you have to go through this season of challenged faith. You don't get to skip it. You have to go through it. And you have to respond to this question, how do I get through what I'm going through? Now here's what we're gonna do. During this series, we're gonna take a look at a story from the Old Testament, and specifically from a book in the Old Testament called Exodus. And let me give you a little bit of background about what happened, and uh, then we'll kind of dive into the story. Um, at, at one point, there was a very severe famine in all the land. And all of God's people, the Israelites, all went to Egypt. And the re reason they went to Egypt was because one of their guys, a guy by the name of Joseph, had actually found favor with the Egyptian king. So much favor that Joseph became uh, the second in command, got promoted all the way up to second in command of all of Egypt. So all of God's people, the Israelites, show up in Egypt and they find favor with the Egyptians. And at first it is great. I mean, they are having the good life at first. But then you fast forward several hundred years later and that favor has long been forgotten. Now, actually, the Israelites are slaves. They're living in slavery. They're being mistreated. They're being abused. And life is brutally hard for them, brutally hard. And they're having to answer for themselves back then the question, how are you gonna get through what you're going through? How are we gonna get through what we're going through? And what I wanna do is I wanna look at very quickly Two different scenes, okay? Two different scenes in their story. And what you're gonna see is two very different responses. Two very different responses of how to get through what you're going through. All right, let's pick up the story. It's in Exodus chapter three. Now, at this point, God has chosen a man by the name of Moses. Maybe you know that name, Moses, an Israelite to lead his people out of Egypt. Now, when we pick up the story, Moses is tending uh, his, the, the flock of his father-in-law, father 
And he came upon what's called the mountain of God. And uh, here in Exodus chapter 3, he has this experience. It says, there the angel of the Lord appeared to him, appeared to Moses, in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Okay? Pretty freaky sight. Uh, Now understand, all throughout the Bible, fire is often used as a sign and, and kind of a signal that God is present. So with that kind of understanding, Moses, he sees this burning bush. He does what any kind of curious person might do. He kind of slowly walks towards it, begins to investigate what's going on in this crazy situation. And as he gets closer, the bush actually begins to speak to him. And he recognizes it's God's voice. And here's what, here's what he hears. It's God speaking to him. I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now go. He's talking to Moses. Now you go. I'm sending you to the Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. All right, you got a lot happening, a lot going on. But here's what I want to draw our attention to particularly today. How did the people of Israel, God's people, how did they respond to those tough times? It was right in there. How did they respond to these tough times? Let's look at it again here, and I want to highlight something, all right? It says here, indeed, I've seen, my, seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and he says this, I have heard them crying out. How did they respond to their suffering? They cried out to God. That's what they did. They cried out to God. In the middle of a miserable situation, in the middle of their suffering, they just, they, they cried out to God. And what they discovered was a God who's like a loving father. And that they were like children who were kind of like just crying out, maybe in the middle of the night, out of fear or a bad dream. And, and this father shows up. He wants to, he wants to be with them. He wants to hear what's going on with them. He even says, I'm concerned. I'm concerned about your suffering. I'm going to take action. I'm going to rescue you. And here's what I want us to get. I really, really, really want, and maybe this is the reason that you're, that, you're, that you're listening to this talk today. I want you to get this. We have to remember that the God of the Israelites is the same loving Father who sees us, who hears us, and is concerned for us in our pain and in our struggle. This isn't, okay, this is not just kind of some ancient story that we kind of roll out as a motivational speech. No, this is the actual, this is the same God. This is our loving God and how he responds to us with concern. And I really want you to get that. I think it's so important to get you through what you're going through. Now, it keeps going. A few chapter layers, we get to Exodus chapter 13. We see God does intervene, right? He does intervene. He does respond to their cries, Um, He he uses Moses. He leads the Israelites out of slavery. They become free, right? That's the first story. That's the first scene. And we also saw the first response, the first response of crying out. Now, there's something interesting that happens about 10 chapters later. And I want to point this out. Look at this. Now we flip over all the way to Exodus chapter 13, and it says this. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. Hmm. God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. Now, when you first read this, you kind of want to go like, wait a second, I think God needs a GPS. <laughs> why, why, why didn't he lead them on the shorter road to the promised land? That's where they're headed, right? To the promised land. Why did he lead them down the desert road? And after you, I mean, just, they just went through a tough time. So probably the last thing they were expecting is a desert road. I mean, that didn't feel much like a rescue. What it actually felt like was like more tough times. Well, if we continue to read through Exodus, there are so many amazing things that God does during these tough times. Now, that could be a whole nother sermon, but I thought, tell you what, watch for the amazing things that God's gonna do during your tough times. Because I think some of them, the Israelites missed, because some of the amazing things that happened to them during their tough times, God actually led them by a cloud, <laughs> by a cloud by day and fire at night. Imagine that a cloud was guiding them to the promised land where he wanted them to go by day and fire by night. And then the Red Sea. They got to experience the Red Sea miraculously parting, okay, where they walked across on dry land 
and escape from the Egyptians who were, who were trying to uh, hunt them down and kill them. They also got to see salt water miraculously turn into, into fresh drinking water to quench their thirst. I mean, they see miracles. They see God act. They see supernatural in, interventions during these tough times. But all along the desert road, even though God does some amazing things, you would think that with God showing up like that, they'd be like, okay, we're ready for whatever's next, right? That they were going to be ready to move into a living faith, that third phase, to handle any challenge. Ah, not so fast. So how did the Israelites, the same group of people, now respond to the next tough time? Well, as we get to Exodus chapter 16, look at this. Here's how they responded. It says, in the desert, the whole community grumbled. <laughs> they start complaining against Moses and Aaron. Aaron is actually Moses' brother. The Israelites said to them, here's what they say out loud. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. I mean, back in Egypt, where they were, where they were slaves, there, were, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you've brought us out into this desert to starve this entire sem- assembly to death. <laughs> After everything that's happened, right? All the great things they've seen God do. The Israelites find themselves on a desert road and their faith begins to crumble. They start complaining. They complain about where they are. They complain about what they don't have. And what once were cries out to like a loving heavenly father to rescue them now become like complaints and they're treating God like an absentee boss. Do you see that here? Do you see it? You got one group of people, but two very different responses. One group of people, but two very different responses. Back in Egypt, they cry out to God during those tough times. In the desert, they complain about him. Both are tough times. But once they cry out to God, and the other time they complain about God. And there's a distinct difference. There's a distinct difference between crying out to God and complaining about God. See, uh, complaining, when we respond to tough times as just complaining, it's like a verbal tirade against injustices that we perceive were done and inflicted upon us. It's like we're saying to God, God, it's not fair. I deserve better in this. And in some ways, if we're not careful, we almost make ourselves God because we're telling him how it ought to be. Whereas a cry, which is totally appropriate, is like this deep lament. It's like a plea for help in the middle of any kind of struggle or pain. And it's, we're in our proper place and God gets to be God. And the difference between the two, between crying out and complaining can be boiled down to really just one word. And it's trust. Just one word is the difference. And it's trust. See, see in crying out, We express during that challenging season a determination to trust God. We express our pain. We express our suffering. And hey, we have a very real need. Before I got in here to talk to you, I was was crying out to God saying, we have a very real need. We need for this thing to go away. And only you can do that. You're God. We cry out because we trust we have a loving Father who sees us and hears us. He's concerned. And we trust Him more than we trust ourselves. But complaining about God is is like the opposite of trusting. And instead of trusting him and his response, we decide, you know what, I know what's best. And we demand that God respond to whatever I want. Okay, let's keep it real. Anybody else besides me find yourself complaining this week? That's why we need to be together. And here's the bottom line. Here's the bottom line. Every one of us are going through or you will go through tough times. You'll go through that season of challenged faith. And every one of us, every one of us has to get through what we're going through. Here's what I want you to do. Go back and I want you to look at what you wrote down, either on a piece of paper or in the notes section on our website. Take a look at what you wrote down. What is it that has you feeling like lost in that desert? What has you feeling disappointed and disillusioned? And for some of us, 
the desert experience is maybe just full of unanswered questions. I mean, so much of life and so many things don't make sense right now. Maybe for some of you, it's your work or financial situation, and you're, you just have no idea how this is gonna work out. Or th there may be some whose desert has to do with your own health and, and your own well-being. Well, here's the thing, and I think this is, this is what I learned when I'm passing on to you. Each of us, were one person, but there's two possible responses. And today, what I wanna encourage you to do, starting today and every day, is you just cry out to a loving Heavenly Father. And, and maybe, maybe the thought of crying out to God, it, it never really entered your mind. Um, maybe you were afraid to do that. Maybe you didn't feel comfortable doing that. Maybe you didn't even know, maybe you're going like, I don't even know, is that okay for me to do that? I'll tell you what, it's more than okay. That's exactly what our Heavenly Father wants. He wants us to cry out to Him. I, I intentionally brought my, uh, my journal up here because this is first thing in the morning, every morning, um, like this morning, this is, this is where I write out my prayers after I go through our community Bible reading plan and I cry out to God. And I encourage you to do something very similar. If you haven't got our community Bible reading plan, get that. Use that and then write out your prayers or say your prayers to cry out to God, whatever it is that you're going through. We're also doing something now too that we just started last week. And you know, we're after kind of reimagine church. We're excited about this. We're calling it On the Eights. And on the eights is at 8 a.m. in the morning at all of our Facebook page, all our community location Facebook pages, our staff team are doing a devotional based on the community Bible reading plan. So go there and find those. At eight in the evening, at different Facebook pages, um, often a couple every night, we're offering a time of worship. It's on the eights. And it, th these are just ways that together we can cry out to God. We can cry out to God. And I'd also encourage you this, don't do this thing on your own. You need to come together with your small groups. Um, in the middle of this, God's doing some spectacular things through Community Christian. We're launching 25, at least 25, last I heard, maybe more, brand new online small groups. And these are groups of people who come together, support one another, and in essence, really just to cry out to God together. And that's how we're gonna get through what we're going through. The way I see it, we're in a season of challenged faith. A season of challenged faith. But the good news in it is that you don't ever get to a living faith unless you go through a challenged faith. And so will you, will you just cry out to a loving Heavenly Father? Because I'm telling you, that's how you're gonna get through what you're going through. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you right now. And we do, we're, we're, we're just crying out to you. We know that you created this world, we know you can recreate this world, and we do. We ask that, that this virus that is threatening the health and well-being of many, that is also bringing fear and anxiety to even many more, we ask, we do, we ask that you rescue us from it, that you eliminate it. And Lord, we also ask, we ask that you use it. We ask that you use it this challenging time to draw us closer together and also closer to you. And that is our cry to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I wanna grow a living faith, a deep and abiding faith that remains strong in the midst of life's most difficult challenges. I think most of us want that kind of faith. As I thought about it this week, it reminded me of the old hymn, it is well with my soul, and even more so the story behind that hymn. If you've never heard that story, the lyrics to the song were written by a man named Horatio Spafford, who lived in Chicago in the late 1800s. He was a successful attorney and real estate investor with a large family until everything in his life came crashing down. He lost his fortune in the great Chicago fire of 1871. Around the same time, his four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. And not long after that, his four daughters tragically lost their lives in a shipwreck in the Atlantic Ocean. After experiencing so much loss, Horatio himself set sail for England, and the captain of the ship, aware of the tragedy that had struck the Stafford family, told Horatio when they were passing over the site of the shipwreck. And as he thought about his daughters, 
In the middle of his grief, words of comfort and hope filled his heart and his mind and, and he began to write them down. And they went like this. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. That is a living faith. A faith that stands in front of the cruelest of circumstances and still finds reason for hope. Today, not everything feels well in our lives. There are challenges, large and small. But as we think of all that we and those in our world are facing, we still have reason for hope. We still have reason to sing, it is well.
And right now, I'd love to encourage you, wherever you are, to sing this song with me. Let's sing this together. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, what we can sing it is well is because on a cruel day 2,000 years ago Jesus said it is finished on that day he willingly laid down his life to free us from the bondage of sin and three days later he claimed victory over the dark and evil forces of this world it is well because he is our Savior it is well because he is our Lord as we receive communion together, we celebrate his victory. The bread, a reminder of his body that he willingly gave up for you and for me. Let's receive it together. The cup, it's a reminder of his blood that he willingly shed for you and for me. Let's receive it together. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you today in the midst of these uncertain circumstances. But because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, we know that we can sing and we can pray it is well with my soul. God, thank you for being with us in the midst of this season. Thank you for being the rock, the one that we can count on. Thank you for your constant presence. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your comfort. Thank you for your hope. God, as we continue forward in this season, we know that we can trust you. And so we put our faith in you. We love you. And we're so grateful that you are here with us and that we can be together. It's in your name we pray, amen. As I think of all that is happening in our world right now, I can't think of a better time for the church to be the church. Now is the time for us to share the love, peace, and hope that Jesus gives to us. And we are seeing that right here at Community. Take a look at this picture. This is community attender James Rodriguez, serving at the Daybreak Shelter, where he and his men's group normally serve breakfast together. While the recent shutdowns meant Daybreak was only able to accept pre-prepared donations, with one person per group allowed to meet a staff member out front with the food. Well, James volunteered to be his men's group representative, and here he is at a McDonald's with a receipt. He purchased and delivered 100 breakfast sandwiches to daybreak to help feed those in need. When we say community cares, 
This is exactly what we mean. And while we don't yet know the full economic impact of this crisis, our prayer is that the church will not be hampered, but rather will flourish and be in the position to be the church in our communities and to our neighbors wherever there is need. So as we get ready to give back to God, I wanna make a specific request. Would you click on the word give in the upper right of the screen and set up a recurring gift to Community Christian Church today? Now more than ever, we need a flourishing church to meet the needs of our communities. We hope you'll join us in being generous. Now, as you're giving back to God, let me close with a few reminders. As Dave mentioned, this week we have an opportunity for you to join us on the 8s at 8 a.m. for a morning devotion and at 8 p.m. for a worship night of singing and prayer. So don't forget to check out our Facebook pages for that. Also, we have 25 new online small groups that are starting during this season. If you are not yet connected in a small group, click the banner below to go to communitychristian.org online where you will find information on signing up for a group. And if you have kids, let me remind you that the Kid City Digital Experience begins immediately following this service over on Facebook. Simply click the Kid City tab on the screen above to access the private Facebook group and get ready for an engaging time with your kids. Community, together with God's help, we're gonna get through what we're going through. We're in this together. We'll see you back here for Community Online next week.